The Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app and streaming live on YouTube at the Team 980. It's a Thursday, but this week has been all jumbled around and we haven't heard from Linnell yet. So it's overreaction Tuesday uh, with Linnell here on Ooh. this Tuesday. Linnell, if, if uh, ESPN can do uh, Monday Night Football on Saturday night, then we can have overreaction right. Tuesday on Thursday. For sure we can, for sure we can. And this one is actually special because... I did the pregame with you this week. You did. Awesome time. Cool going out to uh going out to tap at MGM. What did we say during the pregame show? We, we said, said so we, many things. We said that we for said, three we, hours. We said a, a gazillion of things. One of the things that we said or that we discussed back and forth is would Sam Howe get benched? And I felt going in for whatever reason that it, it was gonna go that way. That Jets defense is ferocious. They got after him, and he, like we had said. I think a week or two ago, it was a broken quarterback. So he yeah. continued to look broken on Sunday. But it was just like, wow. I will give you credit because I was pretty adamant, like, nah, bro. Like, they're not going to bench him because if they bench him, he's done. And I guess on that part, I was right. I just didn't think that yeah, right, right. there. Yeah. And I, I think that'll be part of the overreaction if we get right into it. Um, yeah, hit me. While Sam is done for the 2023 season, I would not count him out as being a potential quarterback one option in the future. Maybe not here, but in another location. I do believe in Sam's talent. It's just quarterback is about fit, and you know that. It's going to take him being in the right system, as you alluded to yesterday. I thought you did a great job talking about it. Him being in the right system with the right coordinator that believes in him and his skill set is going to put him in the best position to succeed possible. So I think – we all saw flashes of what he could be. I don't think that stuff just goes away. It's about getting him to do it on a consistent basis and having the right messenger, so to speak. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I, one, thank you. Uh, and obviously, I don't think this is an overreaction because it is exactly what I talked about yesterday, right? And I've been trying to think about it more um, and like different ways to say it that maybe break through a little bit more. Um, one of the ways that I think is interesting to think about it is like a nature nurture type of thing is the people like, yeah. I think generally understand that concept is like, there is some amount of our lives that is our nature that is genetics that is, you know, all the, the stuff that is preordained. Uh, but there's an enormous part of our life that is nurture. And the more, frankly, not to get too nerdy on it, but like the more that psychologists study this stuff, like the amount you're swaddled as a baby has a lasting effect on you as an adult like it's nurture crazy. is really important and so i i think when we talk about it within the context of football um where you go is super important and and how you're used and the idea that sam was always no matter what he was going to be what system he went to what he was asked to do he was 100 percent just going to fall down on his face in week 12 like, that's just not how it works. And and so I think that there's been a lot of people that have kind of been waiting in the weeds to be like, Sam Howell sucks. He's always sucked. And it's like, then then where were you when he threw for 300 five times this year, whatever it, it, it's been? Like, where were you when he was playing really good ball and making leading the NFL in big-time throws and doing all this stuff? The reality is, is that in an alternate universe where he goes to San Francisco or is playing for Bobby Slowick in Houston or Mike McDaniel and, and Frank Smith in Miami or, you know, whoever pick your offensive Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota, right? His year looks different. I think there's certainly room to say that it still could end poorly, that he still could wind up not being that good. I'm not right. saying that it's, it's pre, it was actually preordained that he was good and EB took him off the tracks but like the idea that this was inevitable to me is just so silly. And I'll I'll go back to what you said there at the end. I don't even blame Eric Bieniemy as I think as much as you do. I think Eric called the stuff, and he probably could have adapted to Sam a little bit better. But we've discussed too. It's it's hard to simplify it any more than he was. But I from day one, I've always said, and you've disagreed with me on this. I don't think it makes sense from Ron Rivera's standpoint, from this regime standpoint, to wait until year four to develop a quarterback, unless you're dropping him into just this ideal situation and you weren't. And to me, that's the biggest culprit in all of this is he was put in a situation where it's really hard to succeed unless you're a Joe Burrow type of talent. And we know he's not that, even when we talk about his ceiling. Because you think about it, Joe Burrow was the most sacked quarterback in the league the year that the Bengals made it to the Super Bowl, but 
Sam's not that type of talent. We think his ceiling is like, I think probably like 15 to 20. But like that's if he's in the ideal circumstance and setting. And I don't think we we've yet to see him in that. So that, I think with that, the big time throws that he's made. Yeah, no, I hear you. I think with the big time throws that he's made, his ceiling is more 15 to 10, like somewhere in there. Like I, I think I think he in the right system, if this is a big if, and like this is the part that we might not ever get to know, but we certainly saw didn't wind up coming to fruition this year, is like if other parts of his game develops. Like he has such a high right. ceiling because the stuff that he does is very special and you can't coach. The problem is, is a lot of the stuff that should be coachable – getting the ball out on time, footwork, cleaning up a lot of the basic fundamentals, hitting the layups, that stuff has not gotten better. And in fact, it's regressed and got worse. And that's the thing that I think is such a bummer is like they they just leveraged him so much and exposed him so much. Because even, you know, I did, well, you know, when I try to do math, things get a little hairy, but bear with me here. Oh, you yeah. know, if let's say, let's say your, your bad play percentage is 20%. Right. Uh, when you drop back, bad things happen 20% of the time. Let's even make it, let's make it more realistic 40% and qualify bad things as like incompletions, sacks, perceptions. Right. Well, if that's, if that's your percentage on pure drop back pass and you drop back 10 times a game and that's it because your coordinator is like, we can't drop that kid back. Right. That's four plays a game that bad stuff happens on dropbacks. Right. If you're 30 plays of drop back, that's 12 bad plays. Right. So even just like when I've talked about running the football, it's there's many reasons to it. One of them is it will actually make it so that the bad things can happen less often because you're not as exposed to the risk as often. And that's that's part of why I really dislike what EB's done. I think there's schematic elements too. We did actually a really interesting breakdown of this uh on take command that we recorded this morning that'll be out tomorrow we did like a deep deep dive into how san francisco's built their team um in in order to kind of lay a blueprint as one of the possible paths for washington and in that discussion like did you know that they're last in the league in pass attempts san really? francisco is? well it, it makes sense though i mean you think about part of that is like they're up in a bunch of games do. that so like but last the game kinda, close. Yeah. yeah but they're they're dead last yeah. But they're also top five, if not two or one, in explosive plays. I don't want because to be... they they, they just understand how to create like matchups and hey, we're gonna make it so that you bring eight players into the box, and then all of a sudden you have bad personnel in the field, and you, you have, have yeah, you respect the run, and then we yeah. hit you with thirty yard bumps and, and Debo Samuel running behind your defense. So like that's the kind of stuff that I just think. You know, Brock Purdy's life is a lot easier for a lot of reasons, including he's got Debo and Christian and, and Kittle and all these guys. But th there's so many, so many different factors to it. Um, when you look at why a young player succeeds or fails, and especially quarterback, but this is true for other positions too. I have a, I don't want to call it a conspiracy theory, but it's definitely going to come off as a conspiracy theory. Do you think there's any spite in the play calling at a certain point in terms of the decision that ultimately got made? Uh, no, Where it's like, look, see, no, because I actually think I liked EB early in the Jets game as much as I've liked him all season. Um, things just went poorly, the... yeah. He went screens, he went rollouts, and it's just like you can't, you can't make the kid execute. And by the way, early on in the Jets game specifically, you can't make other guys like I think it's the right. first seven plays you have either drops or receivers fall down, and like yeah. when Sam's confidence is on thin ice, like it broke. Because he, you know, it's supposed to be like, hey, we're going to get you the easy stuff. And he's like, I can't even get these guys to stand up for the easy stuff. What are we doing? And so, yeah, it's, I don't think spite's the right word. Um, I do think there's probably a level that they're like, hey, if he can't do it this, then he can't play well, quarterback. Can, you know, but yeah. I also don't think that, like, I don't think that assessment is correct because I don't like the way that they ask their quarterback to play quarterback. If That's a personal opinion. That's just an offensive. You would, if you were a coach, you would not be running this system and scheme. Period. I feel it's, like it's it's how you deploy it, though, right? Like, right. There are a ton of great passing concepts, a ton of great stuff in this in this system in this scheme, and it's been extremely successful. Obviously, um, this is an offshoot right. of the scheme that's won two of the last four Super Bowls. Like, 
and probably more than that, even th thinking back, because like it's a West Coast offense. It's just sure. how you do deploy it. What's your run game look like? How does it marry with your pass game and your play action game? Um, you know, how often do you call certain concepts? How do you get to them formationally? There's a good example in the Jets game where like Byron Pringle is running a, a corner and it's probably better if Terry's running that corner because it, it probably more realistically draws coverage and you get the underneath route below it that you're actually trying to hit. And so like, how do you deploy your personnel in certain situations? So yeah, there's a lot to it. It's super nuanced. It's super complex. No, Fans just want to be mad on the radio and hear being like, it's all this person's fault. And it's, it's everyone's not. got equal. Um, everyone's got equal blame in it. I feel like with this yeah, situation, but I, I think, I think that we agree on this. You think going Jacoby at least this weekend is the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm also on the same token, like, well, you put him out there the last two weeks and pulled them. Why not just give him a, just keep giving them cracks at it. Like you get taking them off the field, I think is the ultimate confidence breaker. Being someone that has like played team sports before, like getting benched, like sucks. It makes you feel like I can't do it. You don't believe in me. So like them rolling him back out there, I think would have at least made what they've been saying the last 15 weeks at least be consistent, so, you know? I think that's interesting because I've also played team sports. And, like, if I were to get benched, I would be like this. It depends on, like, why you get benched, right? Like, if you think you're getting benched because your coach is being unfair, then you're probably going to spiral a certain way. But I think right. Sam can look in the mirror and be like, I'm getting benched because I have not played well. And so I yeah. think it's – I see it as a chance to be like, okay, the pressure's off. I can take a deep breath. I can reset. I actually think this is the best thing for him in the same way that it was good for Kirk getting benched early in his career that allowed him oh, to be pulled out of that spiral. So you don't yeah. keep, you know, spiraling to the inevitable. And maybe we're already past that. Maybe we've passed the point where he is cooked for his career. But right. if, if not, um, and you pull him out just before he drowns, if you will, like you saved his, you saved his life instead of, instead of, you know, saying, Hey, well just go try again, kid. He's like, I can't swim. Somebody help me. Exactly. And to that point, I think I would think about starting him in the final game against Dallas just to give him I another agree. crack at it. Let him be behind Jacoby this week, see how Jacoby prepares, and then let him go try to swim again. Yeah. By the way, why did I sound like Jerry Seinfeld when I was doing this, uh, this swim thing? <laughs> hey, somebody help me. I just got to try to a, swim. You actually have a decent Jerry Seinfeld is what I was saying. It's, I, know uh, you, I know we wanted to get in the quarterback, too. Well, well, maybe. Maybe. I probably can have one, too. But I'm not. Right, your impressions are not bad. Um, Thanks. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Uh, when we come back, Linnell has got some quarterback thoughts on where they go, not in week 17, not in week 18, but next year. And those, those, my friends, those might be some overreactions. We'll get to it next. <laughs> Overreaction Tuesday slash Thursday with Linnell here on The Hoffman Show. Hoffman Show. We're on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. Continuing with our overreaction Tuesday slash Thursday holiday week. Schedules are fun. Uh, Linnell is here. All right, so moving forward at quarterback, I yeah. am trying to keep my options open. Everyone else is like, they should do this. You seem to be in a uh, I have a plan category. What is your plan? I hear what you're saying, and I haven't heard your thoughts on quarterback next year yet, so We'll, we'll see where we're at with this. I do, when you say keep your options open, there's only so many options I think you can go. Option one to me is if you end up with the second pick, you I think you may do whatever you can get on. And if you, it's all dependent to me, and I'm going in circles here. It's dependent on whether or not you love a quarterback in this draft. That's what I think needs to be the first thing at hand because the one thing I'll say about Caleb Williams, Drake May, and all of these prospects, it's December. By the time we get to April, these evaluations are going to be turned upside down for some of these dudes. Um, some of them have more games to play. Um, and some of there are, there's always that late riser in the process that maybe they fall in love with. So that's the first thing is falling in love with a guy. And then there's the scenario in which you don't fall in love with a guy. Then your options are really wide open because you can trade back. You can potentially take the luxury piece there at number two or three with the tackle of the wide receiver. And then you get into the free agent veteran quarterback market, which your hand is kind of already in because of your familiarity with Jacoby Brissett. You have Sam Howell coming back under contract, no matter what, unless someone's crazy enough to trade for him this off season, which is another scenario, but this is crazy hypothetical. 
if they don't love a quarterback and they have a coach that feels like they can work with Russell Wilson on a decent contract. No. And then not you, interested. No. It was just hypothetical. This is what the segment's for. It's overreactions. Do you, would you actually – are you just doing that to get a rise out of me, or do you actually think that Russell Wilson would be – I mean, he hasn't played bad ball this year, but, like, I've just heard too As many stories Brit? about how that dude is a weirdo. I don't want him mentoring the next guy. Well, I hear you on that. And Pablo Torre did a whole that, Pablo Torre finds out episode headline. about it. If that ends, if this ends up being the headline for the segment, I'm going to be very upset. So I hope <laughs> Digital is listening on that because I know how that could get. But no, I, it, hypothetically speaking, though, you can go the bridge quarterback route still and take one of the luxury pieces with your top five pick, or you could trade back, which I think may be the best thing to do because you need as many pieces as possible here. And you may be able to flip, flip, and end up with 11, 12, 13 picks in this Look, draft. I, you, you basically just espouted my wide array of options fall in love with a guy uh trade back or take if you like fall in love with fashanu or harrison then like by all means right but that in the break that's not what you said i want you to say the thing you said in the break because that that is the spicy take well i think by the time we get to april Jaden daniels will end up being the number one quarterback prospect and not caleb williams and i'm not doing any i'm not a reporter i don't speculate but caleb williams is from this area and the circles are not as small as you may think they are. Once we get to through the pre-draft process, certain teams are going to be turned off by Caleb Williams and Caleb Williams camp and things of that nature. And from a football standpoint, and I'm just going to go to football, playing in Pac-12, not, not the best conference, I don't think he showed the ability throughout his time in college to play on schedule on a consistent basis. And he doesn't have the athleticism at the NFL level to me to play off schedule as much as a guy like Lamar does. And I'm saying Lamar because I think he plays off schedule more than anybody in the entire league. And he's, oh, he's the maybe best, the best at it for sure. He's the best at it. Well, and Caleb's not, not that type not of Not in the Holmes category. Right. And he's not that type of athlete. So I don't know. He's going to have to be in a situation to me where he has his game refined in year one, the way Patrick Mahomes did in his first year in Kansas City, just to fine tune the things and not taking away any of the special stuff where he makes the crazy plays off schedule. I don't want him to rely on that because if you notice like Patrick Mahomes doesn't rely on that but it looked like he was on uh, a Monday at least and that's, yeah, no, what, it that's what it looks like when you're relying on it. yeah and he still kind of survived in that game for a little bit but they just couldn't, yeah. they couldn't string anything together um, yeah. even if Mahomes at times was moving it um, I think that's super interesting um, I do I have I don't know enough about any of these guys to say anything definitive yet um, but me either and I'm just with, saying it from with Williams know now. you know with his dad already having a bunch of stuff out there in the press and he just did a GQ article and you know, there, there's definitely some, like some of the old guys yelling at clouds about NIL, they're actually yelling about Caleb Williams. And like, this guy's got some star power to him in a way that I do think some old school football people are not be- going to like. Yep. And the, the not question, to say this group won't not to say, this well, that's group the thing. Won't. Well, there's two questions then one Is that just stupid old people being stupid old people? I'll do respect Mm -hmm. to the elders. Uh, And two, (laughs) like, does this group care? And it depends on who this group is. We don't even know who this group is yet. You know, Josh Harris is one thing. Like, Magic Johnson, uh, yeah, Magic Johnson in 1979 had star power and was probably doing all kinds of stuff. And Jerry Buss was the perfect use for that. (laughs) And it was a match made in heaven. Um, I do think that there is probably going to be someone who needs to ask the question, do, do the commanders need to draft another kid from the DMV? Like, is that hometown thing that what, went yeah. wrong with Chase Young and went wrong with Dwayne Haskins uh, before, obviously, Dwayne left and, and RIP? But, like, is the hometown complication something where that's a problem here? And, like, it shouldn't you know, it be, sounds, though, Craig, It because... sounds harsh, and, and it, you're right. It shouldn't be, but you have to ask the, the question. Opposite. I think it should be literally the opposite. You, you're you around the area where these kids grew up at. It's so easy for you to go really dig and do your proper homework and talk to the right people. That's why it's important who you have in your building, man. There's such things as football people in your building, and then you have connectors who do deal with the real-life stuff. And I think they clearly lack that in that building. No, I think that's a great point. And that's, you know, Logan talks about the evaluation versus the scout, right? The evaluation is like, what does this kid look like on film? What does he play? 
And they're like, he always uses Dewan Jones as an example. Like Dewan Jones on film, first round pick. Dewan Jones scout, uh oh. And that's why he dropped and like dropped right. way further than anyone thought he would. And it looks like if he can keep his head on straight in Cleveland, they got a steal. Because um, exactly. he's actually played good ball. He's played like a first rounder this year mm-hmm. out of right tackle. But like if if you you know, you should be able to find out, but I think it's hard to project like how will a kid handle oh, his high school friends being around or his family and some of the the complications of family. And you know, I, I don't say that in a way to be insensitive. No, it's um, real life. Because it's it's real stuff. Um, yeah. and I hope the answer is they figure it out and they're like, you know what? This is all hullabaloo. We don't need to be scared. Like his dad likes to talk a little bit, but he's just a supportive father. Um, who's out there looking out for his kid. Like we're going to take care of him and we're going to provide the football infrastructure and the right mentors and the right veterans and the right, everything, the right coaching staff to, yeah. to take advantage of what is one of the best prospects on the evaluation front that we've seen in a long time. And that's going based off of what I, I know what you're saying too, with like his season was not what I think a lot of people expected, but dude didn't win the Heisman the year before. There's so much good tape for Caleb Williams. And so yes. what I think Daniels is intriguing, though, to get back to your original overreaction hot take, if you will, um, that I do think some people will wind up with because there's always everyone has different boards and some people yeah. like to they're like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm going to be different. I'm going to look for the things and you wind up confirmation biasing yourself into a wrong opinion or sometimes the, the right opinion. Um, but thing I, I think with Daniels like athleticism, it. like he's he's got a chance to rise. The thing I like about Daniels, too, is, like, he's went through stuff in his football career. Like, he transferred there. He had was, – was that – was it Arizona State or, or Arizona? Yeah. And was – had had to deal with things there. Like, he's played a lot of football. I, I like that about him. Yeah. I mean, Caleb transferred and all that kind of stuff, too, obviously with the same coach. Um, but went went from Oklahoma out to USC. And um, I don't know, man. It's, it's going to be interesting. And this is why I'm also, like – the idea that you have to take one of these guys, especially when it's a lottery ticket type of thing. Like I'm still not convinced that if you think for Shanu or Harrison's a hall of famer, like take that dude and tra- you know, you have those two early seconds. Can you trade them both back into the back end of the first and a, you know, and a future third get back into the back end of the first and take Penix. If you like Penix, like you just have to, it, it's hard because you, maneuver you the both, board, right? You gotta, yeah. Yeah. You, it, you can't, it's risky, right? The safest thing to do if you know you need to come out of the first two days with the quarterback is just take one at right. two slash three slash four, wherever they wind up. Um, and that's going to be your best chance to get the best player. That's the nature of it. Um, but we've also seen two years ago's draft included Sam Howell, who's somewhere wildly fluctuating in the middle of the number two pick who stinks in Zach Wilson. I'll do respect. Uh, and Brock Purdy, who until Monday night was a leading MVP candidate and was the last pick in the draft. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, crap obviously, shoot. first rounders better. They, you know, it is it's a weighted crapshoot. I think that's important to remember too. The higher you pick, the better chance, and the more players you're going to have to choose from. But it is a weighted crapshoot, and at that point, you also need to let the next coach evaluate and, and Sam Howell and say like, hey, what that kid showed with different coaching. Yeah. Is that something that where I feel like I can succeed and I can build my roster out in other ways? And I, I think the the hard part is then do you get stuck back in the middle? That that to me is my biggest yeah. fear. Is like you build out the roster around Sam. He's good enough to be a nine, 10 win guy, but not good enough to get you over the top. But then you don't really have a chance to get the next guy. That's what I would be concerned about. And real quick, I think just based on early looks at what people are mocking and because I haven't watched a ton of anything yet. You may be able to trade back, depending on where Washington is, and if you fall in love with a guy. And I'm telling you, during this process, guys are going to get skyrocketed up the board. Like A guy like Bo Nix is probably going to go in the first round. Realistically speaking, looking on needs at quarterback, you may see five or six, I think, in the first round. Yep. You may be able to double up and get a quarterback you love and a tackle. So like, we call, dude, we call that the Houston Texans open. model. Yeah. Yeah, keep your options open. So hundred yeah, percent, um, you know, and by this, by the way, I, I think something else that's probably worth saying, um, as I think about the, the weighted crap shoot theory and also my like getting stuck in the middle theory, like who are the best teams in, in football right now? Chiefs, Ravens, Eagles, <laughs> like what those teams did was build really, really good rosters yeah. and find their quarterback 
middle to late first round or second in the Eagles case in Jalen. So I think yeah. there is some, as much as everyone's like, oh, you've got to take a quarterback. I think there is something to building out the roster and just being a really good balanced football team and understanding that you're going to create the sit, the ecosystem to incubate the quarterback that you can, if you find the Mahomes, if you find the hurts, if you find the Lamar, those guys don't always go one, one overall. It's easier that way. And Caleb Williams might be that guy and he might be worth trading up for. If you wind up at two, do you try to trade up to one? Maybe if you think you he's that him. dude. Um, yeah. But I do think it like the best teams in the league right now are proof that good rosters one through 53, when you football games, you need a great quarterback to win a, a Super Bowl regularly, but like you need that roster balance too. Um, and that's how, that's how winners are built. You know, that's how, how winners are built. That's how you do uh, it. What did you got for the rest of the week? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, you get to – Linnell's done talking for – twenty. did we get the last of Linnell in 2023? Until New Year's Day. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.